I'd like to now invite Dr. Greg Smote to introduce our panel. Dr. Uh, Smote is the director of the American West Center at the University of Utah and a longtime supporter of state history. And thanks, Brad. Um, when state history announced rural Utah as the theme of this year's meeting, um, I immediately thought, well, what we need to do is really in, engage the debate over public lands in the West. It's one of the key issues that we talk about a lot here in Utah, and that's kind of where this came from. I do want to do one more thank you, though, before we get started, and that's to Brian Cannon and Brendan Resnick and, and the folks at the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University who are co-sponsors of this plenary session and always good partners. Um, is this, what, um, as I said, we can't really pick up the newspaper, um, especially during this election cycle, and not read about um, debates and issues involving Western lands, public lands. Um, often these narratives are cast in very stark us versus them ways, rural versus urban, local versus federal. And so the hope with this plenary is to provide a, a more complicated, uh, more nuanced historical perspective on that issue and how it has developed over the course of the 20th century. And I have great, the great fortune of having a lot of good friends who are very talented historians and several of them working on this subject right now. And I'm very happy to say two of them are here with us today. Um, and maybe, as you, should I bring you up as I introduce you? Let's bring them up here first. I'll, I'll talk about them as they, when they, they get up here. To my far right is Dr. Liesl Carr Childers. She is Assistant Professor of History at the University of Northern Iowa, where she teaches courses in public history and Western history. Uh, she did her bachelor's and her master's degree at Pepperdine and her PhD at UNLV. Um, she wrote a, a re really well done dissertation that was published last year by the University of Oklahoma Press, the title of which is The Size of the Risk, Histories of Multiple Use in the Great Basin. And the talk she's going to give um, to start off this, or she's actually going to go second, but this talk she's going to give at the beginning, beginning of this plenary um, is using that same title, The Size of the Risk. To my immediate right is Joseph E. Taylor, or J. Taylor. Um, he is professor of history at Simon Fraser University in Burnaby, British Columbia. He did his bachelor's and his master's degree at Oregon and a PhD at the University of Washington. Uh, he is the author of two award-winning books, his first, Making Salmon, an environmental history of the fisheries crisis in the Northwest, and his second book, a social cultural history, I would say, of climbing, um, called Pilgrims of the Vertical, which looked at um, rock climbing in the 20th century and mountaineering in Yosemite. Um, he is currently at work on a couple of books, um, one, a a biography of his great-grandfather, Edward Taylor, the namesake of the Taylor Grazing Act. You'll hear a little bit about that. And that, doing, in doing that research, it has led him into a very complicated study of political economy and what he calls the long progressive era, and really, I think, promises to rewrite our understanding of that early conservation area, era in the United States. So with that brief introduction, I want to turn it over to Jay first, who will talk about, um, tell us about remembering political economy and look at that earlier period. Thank you, Greg. And um, I need to say a few thank yous here at the same time, not only to Greg, but also to Michelle Judd at the American West Center for helping me to bring me here, but also, um, Jed Rogers has been engaged in a conversation with me for months now about this particular uh, conference and how we cast it a way to engage the broader question of why and how does history matter. And those conversations have been extraordinarily valuable for me uh, beyond just the here and now. So I want to thank Jed. I also want to thank Brad Westwood because I've had some remarkable conversations with him. And Alicia Aldrich, who's going to be backstage magically turning the images on and off for me because I don't know what I'm doing here. Currently in my home state of Oregon, there is one standoff on federal lands in the Rogue River Valley. 
another brewing in the Oahe Basin, and a federal court case trying seven people who tried to occupy the Mount Hill Wildlife Refuge. That's just my state. Here in Utah, conflicts erupt regularly over antiquity sites, off-road vehicles, national monuments, and state house claims to federal lands. And we can hear the similar stories to this in places like Alaska and Arizona, Colorado and Idaho, Montana and Nevada, and New Mexico and Wyoming. This is a regional pathology, one that stems from the West's many complete competing claims to a vast federal domain. I emphasize the word claims here because the term sovereignty tends to eclipse the multilateral relations that actually inhere in these lands. Sovereignty triggers what for me is a dumb custody battle, while claims exposes the many ways that federal lands have and are meant to serve state and county interests as well as federal recreational and ecological interests. I want to illustrate these complex relations and to explain why they exist by examining a congressional hearing on state assumption of federal lands. The hearing was inspired by a Utah congressman, and the lead witness was Utah's governor. But because all this happened many decades ago, what follows can seem topsy-turvy. Utahns explicitly rejected state sovereignty, and they strongly supported federal conservation. This story begins on the 13th of February, 1932 when Montana Congressman John Evans opened hearings on H.R. 5840, which was submitted by Herbert Hoover's Presidential Committee on Conservation and Administration of the Public Domain. The bill proposed to cede portions of the federal domain to accepting states in the American West. Evans, who chaired the Committee on Public Lands and who officially sponsored H.R. 5840, felt no urgency in its passage. But he didn't want to accommodate Utah Governor George Dern, who was in town and wanted to testify. Dern shared Evans's lack of enthusiasm. He said he had, quote, not found anybody in Utah who thinks it would be a paying proposition, end quote. And letter letters from the governors of Arizona, California, Idaho, and Nevada, as well as by ranchers in Nevada, New Mexico, and Wyoming, all supported him. Why? Some of this should be familiar. Every witness noted the degraded condition of the open range. Grasses were overgrazed and exposed soils suffered erosion and torrential flooding. The federal domain was a mess, expensive to administer and decades from recovery. Hoover's committee seemed to be offering a pig in a poke. So Westerners replied, thanks, but no thanks. As he continued, though, Dern's testimony grew ever more complex. He did not object to federal land management. In fact, he said that the National Forest held the most valuable grazing lands in the West because of Forest Service management. He questioned neither the concept or conduct of federal conservation. At one point, he even added, in my opinion, private ownership is not the answer to the problem of overgrazing. Western members of the Public Lands Committee and other witnesses all concurred. There was no debate on this in 1932. And there was similar consensus on federal management of minerals and water power in 1932. Westerners' rejection of H.R. 5840 and support for federal conservation did not, however, signal lack of disinterest or lack of interest in federal lands. Dern commented, quote, if this proposed gift included all the public lands except the national parks, and if it carried with it all the minerals therein contained, I am sure we should all rise up and rejoice over an act of justice long deferred. Dern would later amend this in some important ways, but please note, he never denied federal sovereignty. When Arkansas's Claude Fuller asked whether once, quote, states have been admitted into the Union, the government gives up all rights it has to the land, Dern re replied emphatically, it is not legally true. That was not the end of his answer, but it was the end of the custody battle. 
Instead, like most Westerners, Dern framed the government as a trustee for the Western states and argued that the Constitution's equal footing clause, which holds that new states should be equal to older states, meant that the federal agencies had a duty to manage the federal domain for Western interests. He conceded the moot point about sovereignty, but insisted that the federal domain, quote, equitably belongs to the Western states. Which raises another question. If the dispute wasn't over sovereignty or conservation or privatization, then what was it about? The answer circles back to Dern's remark about paying propositions, and it exposes a huge cultural blind spot. Americans tend to regard the federal domain as open spaces for individual opportunity, aesthetic pleasure, or ecological values. Western states' writers and environmentalists alike erase much of its human history, although different portions. Rarely do they see these lands through the eyes of Dern and Congress, and almost never do they grasp how federal, state, county, and municipal governments all coveted these lands then and now for the exact same reason, as tax bases. The political economy of the federal domain has dropped out of our discourse, but it was front and center in 1932. In a colloquy with Montana's Scott Levitt on the politics of asking for the national forest, Dern noted that transferring title would also divest the government of, quote, its legal authority to continue building those reclamation works which are vital to the progress of the Western states, end quote. Noting that the Mineral Leasing Act, the Water Power Act, and the Oregon and California Lands Investment Act were crucial funding sources for federal reclamation, Dern observed that while divestment would benefit mineral-rich states, it would, quote, kill reclamation in those states which are poor in minerals. This also held for the impact of timber and raising revenues that funded county roads and schools. The revenue sharing features of federal conservation programs were hard-won victories. During the Progressive Era, Westerners forced Congress, and I can't under overestimate how hard they tried to get this and how much it was resisted. During the Progressive Era, Westerners forced Congress to add federal payments, transfer payments to each bill, yet the implications of each program became entangled in a way that led to a kind of regional political inertia. Dern knew it, the Public Lands Committee, even Hoover's administrators knew it. An Interior Department memo noted that, quote, already 90% of the proceeds received by the federal government from minerals under the Leasing Act goes to the states. 37%, 0.5% went to state coffers, and 52.5% went to the reclamation fund. But if, quote, the mineral royalties were to cease to come into a central reclamation fund, only the major oil-producing public domain states would benefit by it, and all of the others would lose. This is why political inertia existed. Federal conservation agencies' duties to western states and counties leveled the developmental playing field in ways that made some states and counties always fond of sustaining at least some federal conservation programs. If everyone already knew this, then why hold the hearings? This leads us back to that Utah congressman who, throughout the testimony, was kind of a Godot figure. He was out with the flu. But Don Colton was nevertheless omnipresent. The congressional representative for Utah's first district from 1921 to 1933, Colton had two pet projects. One was to extend mineral leasing to Gilsonite, which his district had most of in the nation. The other was to regulate grazing lands. The Gilsonite bill passed in 1931, but the grazing bill stalled, even when he was chair of public lands because, as he admitted to the Rules Committee, quote, within our own ranks, I mean those of us from the West, we do not seem to be able to get together. This was the political significance of transfer payments. We can speak of the singular West, but the region fractured on the implications of the payment programs. Each state's unique blend of natural resources meant that each had a different political calculus regarding federal conservation. 
blocked on his own committee. Colton asked the Rules Committee to fund Hoover's Presidential Committee to, as Alabama's Will Bankhead put it, crystallize public sentiment and put it behind members of Congress in order to secure the necessary legislation to regulate the federal lands. Put another way, Hoover's committee was Colton's in run of the Public Lands Committee. The tactic almost worked. The Hoover Committee's bill to grant vacant lands to the West was so widely panned, and the political inertia of federal payments was so clearly illustrated that by default, debate shifted to Colton's effort to place federal ranges under the Forest Service. The bill did pass the House, but it died in the Senate largely because in early 1932 there were much, much faster problems to deal with. Then Colton exited Congress with most Western members after the 1932 purge of Republicans. Colorado's Ed Taylor then assumed the stewardship of Colton's bill, which is partly why we call it the Taylor rather than the Colton Raising Act. But that story moves beyond my point here, which is simply that the 1932 hearings on H.R. 5840 succinctly remind us, as William Faulkner wrote, that the past is not dead. It's not even past. Testimony bared conceptions of the state that were far more nuanced than what academics, politicians, and advocates have offered in the last 40 years. The subtlety of former times is not surprising. The participants in that hearing had witnessed the rise of federal conservation. Some, in fact, had helped bring it into being. Their familiarity with the events and law is instructive. They were steeped in constitutional and federal law, so they didn't waste the time on dead-end debates. They also understood the trade-offs that adhered in federal conservation, and why those argument arrangements, on the whole, work better than not. These are lessons that, at least from my perspective as a historian, Westerners would do well to relearn. We have to relive with the choices made in the past. And while I doubt we'll ever see regional consensus about federal, the federal domain, its history should include attention to the political economy at the heart of federal conservation and how and why it was supposed to serve all levels of Western society. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. And I will turn it over to Lisa. Do you want to work for me? Good morning. I'd like to thank uh, the same people that Jay expressed gratitude to for bringing us here today to speak to you, um, and especially the entire Utah Division of State History. Uh, this is my first plenary session, so um, bear with me as I, as I stand in front of an audience this large for the first time. I've actually lived on the Wasatch Front uh, as a child, um, and I consider this place to be one of my favorite places. I'm a military brat. I've traveled all over the American West, all over the United States. Um, with some touchstones in Europe as well. Um, so the core of what I've always been interested in is place, because I've lived in so many different places. And what I'd like to do is pick up the story where Jay left off with public lands. Um, my research touches more on the post-war period. And I, my approach is a little bit different than his. Um, instead of looking at legal history I t and political history, I'm actually an oral historian. Um, so I'm most interested in those tiny little stories that are expressed by everyday individuals. So let me tell you a little story about an interview I did in 2006. I was the assistant director of the Nevada Test Site Oral History Project from 2005 to 2008. The NTSOHP is a large-scale oral history project that collected the remembrances of those who worked on nuclear testing or were affected by nuclear testing, um, especially in the area around Las Vegas, Nevada. So it's no accident I did this out of University of Nevada, Las Vegas' PhD program. One of my interviews, my first interview, in fact, was with a gentleman named Grayson Uhalde. He's a third-generation bass rancher. He lives in Garden Valley, um, up Cherry Creek, through a cattle gate at a place called Adobin, which turns out to be Nevada spelled backwards. Um, interesting little nugget of knowledge there. I had a hard time finding his ranch. There's no cell phone service. Um, I actually went up there three times before I finally pinned him down to an interview. He's a very busy man. Turns out pushing cattle and sheep requires a lot of time and attention. In that interview, he said some very specific things to me, one of which was at the end of the interview, 
which had to do with this way of life he was living, with the fact that he felt this way of life was disappearing. But if we tried hard enough, uh, perhaps we could hold on to it. And I actually had no idea what he meant. No clue. So I spent the drive home between Cherry Creek and Las Vegas, pondering this particularly troublesome piece of knowledge that he had, he had left me with. After doing a little digging um, about the era of nuclear testing, because that's really why I was conducting the interview, I ran across a report from 1950. It was a Los Alamos report um, that featured discussion of the radiological hazards associated with continental nuclear testing. This report has been seen by a number of people. Uh, it's a pretty well-known report. I think you can even find it online these days. Um, and in these, this era of declassified materials about nuclear testing, it's not even redacted. So I read the conversation that Enrico Fermi and several other famous atomic scientists had about establishing a continental nuclear test site. And one of the things I read really struck me. Enrico Fermi was quantifying the cost of a continental nuclear test site by considering the population density around the test site area in the, air, in the quadrant known as the downwind area. This is the north and east sector of Nevada that's adjacent to the test site. He said that the cost of nuclear testing, or the size of the risk, which is where I get the title of my book, of conducting a continental testing program was that 400 persons across 400 square miles could potentially be harmed or affected by nuclear detonations. What struck me about that is that he actually was thinking in terms of people, in terms of numbers. And in a very interesting way, he was using this as a rationalization for establishing a continental nuclear test site. So to put it another way, what Enrico Fermi was saying was that the cost of the continental nuclear test site was so small that because only 400 persons might be affected, there was no reason not to do it. And I walked away from that document thinking, I wonder who those 400 people are. And it turns out Grace and Holly is one of those 400 people. So the bulk of my work, bulk of my research, then went into addressing who are those 400 people and what effects did they suffer? Now we're not normally accustomed to thinking of nuclear testing as a public lands action or um, operation. But in fact, if we consider militarized lands and testing ranges as part of public lands, then we might be able to come to a better grip of what public lands management looks like. And so it's from this standpoint that I began examining the larger effect of public lands management. Because it turns out there's been a cost to all of them. From the Taylor Grazing Act to the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, there has been a cost associated with public lands management. These laws are passed for the benefit of the nation, based on this concept of the greatest good for the greatest number. But that suggests, like Enrico Fermi's phrase suggests, that there is a cost associated, albeit small. So what does that cost look like? Well, in terms of Grayson Uhaldi's interview, he spoke about two things in particular. I was there to ask him about the effects of nuclear testing, but he also spoke about wild horse management, off-road vehicle use, and a few other forms of outdoor recreation. So what I, what I came to, to think, or how I came to think about this particular pattern of use in terms of Grace and Uhaldi's experience is the idea of mustangs and mushroom clouds. So that's a useful pairing for you. Um, it's been useful for me. Of mustangs, he said, I grew up chasing mustangs, but I mean my dad, boy, if you saw a bunch of horses, forget the cows or anything else, away you went chasing mustangs. I've been on that damn commission, the Nevada Wild Horse Commission, for 10 years, and I just hate to see Nevada's resources getting depleted. As far as the Washington office of the BLM horse deal, I don't think they care to solve the problem. Of mushroom clouds, he stated, as a little kid I can remember people coming around, and they made us wear these badges that I didn't know what it was for. I didn't understand something that you couldn't see could hurt you. But when they shot the sedan crater off, and it looked like it was snowing here, I think I had nightmares and everything everything after that, because that kind of brought it home. So in a very interesting way, he's pairing Mustangs and his frustration about wild horse management with his frustration about being affected by radioactive fallout from continental nuclear tests. So let me take a step to the side for a second and tell you a little bit about um, the struggle to find source material on this kind of project. 
if you're looking at the lives of everyday individuals who live in the central Great Basin, good luck finding sources. You can go to local newspapers, you might have some material there, but the best way to really get at what's going on there is to conduct oral histories. Um, so the work of the Utah Historical Society, for example, I know that Utah um, has fostered a number of oral history collections. Um, the Charles Red Center has fostered a number of oral history collections. These were essential to my work, absolutely essential, as was, in a very interesting way, family histories that are put out by Mormon communities. Uh, Jean Sharp Howerton, for example, the Sharp family in Railroad Valley, which is adjacent um, to Garden Valley, it's just to the west. Uh, her work in her family history was also essential. So to a large degree, my study relied upon resources that were produced by the people who were engaged in their own lives, the histories that they produced for themselves. Um, so I would encourage anyone in the room who is doing this kind of work, keep doing more of it, because we absolutely need more of it. I can't do my work unless you do yours. So with that said, um, let me tell you a little bit about what I found. Place is at the center of public lands management, and you have to understand a few things about how place functions to, in order to really grapple with Grace and Uhaldi's experience and those like him. Richard T. Ely, an early land economist, explained it this way. The relate, he said, the relation of one part of the Earth's surface is definitely and unalterably fixed to every other part. No two pieces of land are alike. In this way, land is not substitutable. One place is not substitutable for another. Each place has its own unique characteristics. So when Grayson Uhaldi talks about being affected in his home with radioactive fallout and being um, frustrated with wild horse management, and he actually told, told a story about an off-road vehicleist who crashed into his horse trailer. And for clarity, there's no cell phone service, as I said earlier. So, this particular individual ended up seeking help from Gracian directly because he had a broken arm and a possible broken leg, and there's no hospital for 60 to 100 miles. So in many ways, Gracian bears the burden of emergency services out there as well. So it's too easy to say, well, if Gracian Uhaldi doesn't like wild horse management or he fears the effects of radioactive fallout, why didn't he just move? Well, you can't. Home is home, first of all, and then no two places are substitutable. His family had built this ranching operation anchored with water rights and grazing allotments, adjacent grazing allotments, and it's not like he could just up and sell. So he's forced into a situation where he has to grapple with these particular details. And then looking at the Great Basin landscape at large, what I came to understand is that because of its preponderance of public lands, the Great Basin is a perceptive hole on the nation's mental map where seemingly inconsequential populations grapple with national interests and pressures. Now, you live in the Wasatch Front, and you look west out over the Great Basin, and anybody who drives across I-80, I-15, Highway 93, 91, 89, most people who take those roads look out at the landscape around them and say, wow, there's nothing here, and nobody lives there. And that attitude comes from a particular cultural framework that we've developed about what land is for, but what those people don't realize is how much work and effort and activity goes into that particular landscape. It's hard to see, but it's there. So when we say things like, nothing's here and nobody lives there, we're disparaging both the population and the place itself. But the Great Basin is actually the heart of the continent, and it's the nation's conscience, a place that embodies the priorities and indiscretions of public lands management. So pondering the consequences of making visible the costs of public lands management, the size of the risk, leads us to what? This is the question that I am continuing to grapple with. So let me leave it there for your consideration, and then we can take questions. Thank you, Lisa. And what I want to do is I'm going to pose a couple of big questions to the panelists and have them discuss them for a little bit, but we do want to save some time for the questions we we're sure um, that you all have. Um, I want to start with a big question of what's missing from the current understanding and debate over public lands. Jay, your work presents a very complicated um, picture of the progressive era. You're looking at it from a legislative point of view rather than an administrative point of view. Um, Lisa, you're asking what is the actual effect on people and families in the Great Basin. And when we hear the public 
lands debate today, it, is, it often really is presented in, in fairly narrow ways. And there are certain iconic acts and actors we hear about from early conservation or, um, for instance, we hear a lot about the Antiquities Act in, in Utah today. Um, but there's a lot more there. And so I hope both of you would maybe take a few minutes and talk about some of the key moments, the key factors that are, have been left out of the debate today that Utahns and Americans in general really should know about, should understand. Okay. Um, what's missing? A lot of things. Um, I think I'd stress two points, though, uh, that I think are absolutely crucial. One is, to borrow a phrase from the historian Brian Bala, uh, the government out of sight, which is much of what I talked about today and I think much of what I'm going to be writing around about for the rest of my career. And believe me, I never imagined myself in the position of right here right now, and I could go on for a long time, but I never imagined myself actually becoming a very solid uh, political historian in the sense of just fascinated with how bills evolve and how we come to, you know, the sausage-making process by which Congress produces bills. And uh, it may be in my genes, I don't know, but it suddenly came out and I became absolutely fascinated this, by this, partly because when I got into the nuts and bolts of how people massage legislation, not simply from its proposal to its ending, but why it changes so much in between, I became absolutely fascinated. But in the process of all of that, a lot of things got done that in the time they were being produced, everybody was very explicit, as I pointed out today, with the purpose of what they were doing. And yet, what immediately happened, what Brian Vallaw talks about, is the degree to which these mechanisms, which are absolutely critical, and I'm, when I say they fought hard, in the case of the Federal Mineral Leasing Act, what was pro proposed in 1908 does not come to fruition until 1920, and the end doesn't look anything like what the Roosevelt conservationists wanted at the beginning. And I step back and I look and said, okay, this was a moment where Congress hammered and hammered and hammered and came to compromises that on the whole were far wiser than what was produced at the beginning. But nobody gets that anymore. But even more than that, very few people even understand that these revenues move back and forth. And by that, I even mean the people at the state level who receive these monies. I have literally had conversations with people in state government who get the checks from the BLM and the Forest Service. And their job is to pass it on to the state coffers and their treasurer or down to the counties uh, for use for roads and schools and things like that. They have no idea where this money comes from. They have no idea why. They don't know why it's going where it's going. And in the case of one woman, a very kind, she was key to my research at one point. She'd been doing it for 30 years, but it was a check that came in, she processed and moved on to it. There's no history behind it. And the public is even less aware than she was of that. So one thing that's missing is simply the awareness of the government that's out of sight that yet is crucial in many respects. And the other thing, and this will be a segue to you, is simply a vast chasm in terms of simply understanding, let alone empathizing, let alone sympathizing, that goes on between rural, the rural West and the urban West. There are these operative caricatures out there, and the one that drives me the craziest is the notion of welfare ranchers and welfare loggers and welfare miners. Um, because we could equally talk about welfare kayakers and welfare backpackers and welfare bird watchers and a whole series of other categories as well. Um, without politicizing it, you know, these are very powerful rhetorical devices, but they bear a chasm of ignorance that is mutual. Go. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate what Jay said about making the visible, the invisible aspects of how these payments work. Um, I'm also interested in the ways in which 
the people on the ground helped shape the implementation of these laws. So one of the things that I found to be true is that from the Taylor Grazing Act all the way through FLTMA, these laws are codifying what's already happening. They are not initiating a new management structure so much as they're um, making legal things that are already happening. So how then do ranchers like Grace and New Holly, and this bears a lot of further ex exploration, how then are they complaining then in the future about the Taylor Grazing Act not, not functioning? How do they lose their position? Um, how does the Bureau of Livestock and Mines go from you know extractive industry into some form of conservation? We have some studies on that, but I have a sneaking suspicion that the ways in which these laws are being reshaped on the ground in unique ways bears a little more consideration. And let me give you a, a, an illustration of that. Um, in the nuclear testing period, uh, radiation monitors used to measure radi radioactive fallout on site and then also off site. So specifically in areas surrounding the test site at places like Adobin, um, at Nyala in the Railroad Valley, at the Sharp Ranch, etc. In the early part of nuclear testing, these radiation monitors stuck to the script. They said things like, "You're gonna, this is fine, you're gonna, you shouldn't be worried about it, um, you should probably be inside from 10 a.m. to or 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. Um, on this particular date, but they didn't really disclose any information about exposure to radioactive fallout, what happens, what you should watch out for. And this really frustrated the ranchers. In fact, it, it frustrated them to the point of absolute anger, where they wanted testing stopped. But in the 1960s, the early 60s, we see a shift in the function of radiation monitoring, where a few of them, a guy named Donald James and Chuck Costa in particular, Kenny Glynn as well, they started communicating differently with these ranchers, working more collaboratively, saying things like, with a shrug, yeah, you know, you might have to watch out, or, you know, here, here's a gallon of milk, they often did this milk exchange, here's a gallon of milk I brought you from Las Vegas, I'm going to take this gallon of milk for monitoring, but I'm going to replace it with this uncontaminated gallon of milk to make sure that you're okay. They started doing these little things off script, to not reassure ranchers, but to ensure that they had a little bit more information, they were a little bit more informed. And these men became part of these ranchers' families. And in land management, we're used to thinking of this as the capture problem, where land managers, federal officials, are then, if they're too close to ranchers, they are captured, they work on behalf of these ranchers, and we condemn them for their lack of um, distance. But maybe that's the wrong way to think about it. Maybe we should look a little bit more closely at this thing that we're used to thinking about in a negative fashion and flip that around and think about it in a more positive fashion. Because I'm wondering if we're really serious about co-management or even cooperative management. This is a pathway that you know sits in this very small, specific spaces throughout the Great Basin. And it could be a better pathway forward. Um. That leads us to another big question on, uh, I would say, empathy. And uh, the debate, as we see it, and also we see it on the news, tends to be focused upon people who take um, rather sometimes violent or threatening violent actions, and those, those people are sometimes then, or oftentimes, they become the face of the people who have been impacted by federal management. And, the question then is, what responsibility do you feel as historians to those communities, to the communities that rightly or wrongly, realistically or not, have felt marginalized and most impacted by public land, federal plans in the West? Well, I have to admit to writing uh, an article for Blog West, a, uh, a conversational blog that uh, myself and three other scholars started as a way to sort of reach into the public sphere and articulate a few things about ongoing issues with public lands management and other, other aspects of American West history. In other words, putting our histor historians' skills use for public good. Um, but the piece I wrote was about understanding Clive and Bundy, and that solicited a lot of interesting comments. Um, in fact, I think I've sort of become the face of apology in some ways for Clive and Bundy, because what I was suggesting is that we should stop treating him like some sort of ideologue and objectifying his um, position 
and start understanding where he's coming from. So I'm, I was asking audiences to stop treating him like he's crazy and start treating him like he actually has a point. That was a little hard for people to swallow. Um, Jay and I have had some conversations about this, so I'll let him tell you um, his position on that particular piece. But do you feel like then that you have been captured by that side? Has the federal agency been? <laughs> well, I can't be captured because I'm not getting paid. <laughs> Good point. Uh, that's a perfect point to uh, switch it on. Because uh, I was one of the people who was butting heads with uh, Lisa over that piece. And, but it wasn't about the notion of hypothetically understanding it. Uh, I actually do think quite a bit he's an idiot. Beyond that, though, and that was where we butt. And that was all where we butt. Because, in essence, I agree entirely with you notion that I mean this is what historians actually do. What we actually do is go out and try to understand the world as it is experienced through the eyes, the minds, the physical interactions of the people in the past. Our job is to as best we possibly can explain how people experience life in the past. And I don't know how you do that unless you learn how to empathize with them. But empathy is not the same thing as sympathy. Um, I empathize tremendously. I've been doing recent, uh, biographical research on a very, very powerful member of Congress for a number of years. I don't sympathize with him on a whole lot of things, but I've learned to see the world through his way and to try to translate that into a language that is comprehensible in the here and now. And if historians are not engaged in the exercise of empathy, they're not working hard enough. Period. That's my bottom line on that. Well, Well, I, but I, I just to jump in here, I think that, you, again, in sympathy versus empathy, I think that in, in both cases, we have historians of you who are empathetic, in which they try to understand the position of the other person, but not necessarily sympathetic or argue in that favor. And I think more often than not, historians get painted as the, on the other side of that debate, not being sympathetic or empathetic to rural people, that they represent universities and urban areas and their you know, their take on this, and so they're they're biased against um, those folks. But I think if you do work like Liesel has, where you go out and actually sit down with people in their homes, it makes a big difference. It really does. I do a lot of oral histories myself, and I think that definitely can shape um, the way you view. You may not agree with their position politically or, or something, but you understand the position that they might find themselves in. Yeah, but there's a very important distinction between those two worlds. And I understand where you see the blurring happen. Um, and it will. I mean, some not everybody does this, you know, exercise well. But I think it's absolutely necessary. Otherwise, you know, it, it, it ends up evolving to something much simpler and much more rhetorically like adverse speech, which I'm not interested in. I've never been interested. I was raised by lawyers. I was trained to be a lawyer. I was trained to fight people. And I do it well. But I don't feel good about it at times. And um, I ultimately wasn't a lawyer because I wasn't interested in what I found to be an intellectually impoverished way of trying to understand life. Period. <laughs> Um, 
I have another question. And this is going to shift gears, though. But I think we need to talk about the money, talk about e the economics of this, because the debate often turns on that. And we still, in your book, talk about money. In, in your book, you know, you start with the, to explain multiple uses it develops, you start with this premise that is, that is permeates this period that all land has to have some kind of value. And land that doesn't have value, that, that's a wasteland, it's a real problem. It, and people just have to figure out a way to deal with this. And Jay, in your work, you've come to this, you, you, you argue very vociferously now that, that it's really about the tax base. That's, we have to think about that. We have to think about who benefits from Western conservation and not think in these simplistic ways. And if you don't know, Jay has a website that's going to be up at Stanford University called Follow the Money, where you can follow these federal transfer programs. But I'd like you to both talk about that. Maybe this will start with you and talk about why policymakers went in that direction. What have been some of the, the ramifications for it? Advantages or drawbacks to making this, believing that land has to have some kind of monetary value attached to it? I think land is configured as property in the United States. It has been from the beginning. I don't think we have an alternative way to configure real estate. Um, this, this idea that Jay presents about land having, being a tax base for someone. Uh, Richard T. Ely wrote that idle land is never neutral which means that somebody has to own it because somebody has to manage it and that costs money. So one way or another, land has to earn an income, either for a private citizen or for a state or for the federal government. We've never configured it otherwise. The challenge going forward in public lands management is probably figuring out how to reconfigure that property construct in a comfortable way. Because perhaps not all land needs to earn revenue. And perhaps if it earns revenue, a sufficient amount instead of a maximum amount might be more appropriate. Um, I was recently at the Property Environment Research Center in Bozeman, Montana, and there's nothing scarier than sitting in a room full of economists as a historian and being told that everything has a monetary value. That was a fascinating, eye-opening experience for me. But one of the other scholars in the room, whose name is going to escape me now, but if you're interested, I will look her up. She crafted a paper for the Virginia Law Review that listed 12 points about public lands. And this is based on her analysis of the co cooperative management um, experiment that went on at the Bias Caldera. Um, this area was managed under a, a unique framework for a, a period of time of about a decade. It's now shifted to the National Park Service. And out of this experiment, um, she determined that despite the mandate for this experiment, this particular management plan of this land being self-sustaining monetarily, that public land actually is not designed to earn money. What it does best is not earn income. And that challenged every single economist in the room to reconsider their position on why public lands have to make money. Um, now, they didn't successfully quite get over the hurdle that they, it really does. But it bears considering. You know, from my perspective, what's interesting about that conversation you all heard is that it would have been utterly mundane in the progress era. Among the people I'm following, you can find among the representatives in Congress, you know, both in the House and the Senate, you can find one, maybe two, who are devoutly, steadfastly opposed to conservation. And you can find maybe a handful who are devoutly for closing off the public domain and protecting nature. And in between you are the vast majority of people. They all agree on the ideal of husbanding resources for the long term. They all agree on the ideal that the lands that were out there that were just not going to be settled and put into private ownership, and this is one of the key things, they talk about it all the time, we want this in private ownership, not because of some sort of modern notion that the government is evil, but because it gets on the tax basis. And that's how we end up paying for the social services that government gives us. And that's why it's about money. 
most of the people who I'm reading about and have been following got their start at local and state government levels providing social services. And in the West, you bang your head against the wall of untaxable lands, this vast federal domain that they could not tax, they could not regulate, that was because of the lack of regulation oftentimes going south very quickly ecologically, but even more so without the regulation, what you had was a very violent landscape among ranchers because you couldn't orderly divvy it up. And those were the things that were actually driving them in this conversation that begins really in the 1870s and 1880s and lasts right up until the end of the uh, Second World War. What we call progressive conservation has this much long, larger arc, longer arc, excuse me, and central to it is trying to figure out how to make enough money to do the things government will do. And they're not at all, they were never completely opposed to the idea of setting places aside. That was this thing that happened in the middle of it called the National Park Service Act. And my great-grandfather, who is often in the literature called an anti-conservationist, was one of the two key figures in the House pushing that bill and a lot of other things. And the labels of conservationists and anti-conservationists break down very, very quickly. They're kind of useless at some points because there was no hard distinction between caring about nature and caring about making enough money, finding a way to get money coming in. And really, one of the crisis points in all this is the fact that the old way of raising money by the early 20th century, which was the tariff, had become the third rail of federal politics. It wasn't working for anybody, and they were desperate to find a new source. And lo and behold, what they do is they do two things. They turn to the federal lands, and they start imagining the federal government as a rentier on these lands. And the other thing they do is they pass the thing called the income tax. So in the middle of this is all tied up with a much larger politics than simply grass and trees. You know, this so do you think that there is also an attitude problem about the lands? Um, I'm thinking specifically about the Great Basin, where the conflict between ranchers was not as strong. So the Great Basin story and the Taylor Grazing Act is a different story than that of Colorado. Um, a lot of the in the Central Great Basin, for example, in Railroad Valley and Garden Valley, um, they already had the range organized yeah. via water rights. Yeah. So to what extent then is this problem also predicated on some cultural frameworks that we, we grapple with. It's not just economic frameworks. Um, I would not separate ecological and cultural in any sense. And the reason is that the stakes in the Great Basin were different than the stakes in Colorado, where a lot of minerals and a lot of trees were uh, withdrawn from uh, uh, entry in Colorado. A, I would also always remind people that Gifford Pinchot is the wild card in all this. He comes across in the literature to this day as a great hero of this. He was the Satan in Colorado for many, many years. And in fact, you cannot explain why Colorado politically goes Democrat without reference to things that Gifford Pinchot did. Um, and it became so antagonized that what starts out as a personal headbutting between Gifford Pichel and a lot of people who really wanted just local control of this stuff. And by local, I mean state control. It wasn't anti-government. It was about the federal government and the loss of the revenues that were going to go to the federal government. And they were profoundly significant, especially when these bills were, these policies were first uh, proposed. Excuse me. Um, so, you know, it gets back to my point. Each state's got a different mix of resources and it, it changes the political calculus of all of this. Colorado was front and center. Colorado was the first place that you had large withdrawals of timber. And what they thought at first, at first they were really excited about it because they thought it was going to be a national park, another national park. The national parks are actually, as an economic engine for a, a, a region, pretty good thing on the island. Late 19th and early 20th century, the idea of a national park meant a lot more tourists coming to you, and they could look at that. But the national force, as it actually worked out, was something very different, and they weren't as excited. 
what happens when the land is considered to be utterly worthless? Colorado never really had this problem, but this is the problem that Utah faces and Nevada faces. Yeah, uh, worthless in itself always, uh, not simply spatially context, uh, contextualized, but temporarily. So, um, you know, the lands around Moab in the 1940s and 1950s uh, had some value because of rain, but otherwise, you talk to a BMX writer these days about Moab and Slick Rock, and you see a value that wasn't there then. So these things change over time. But the problem is the laws are written as is the moment. So what's the kind of what valueless or valued at any given moment depends on a much broader you know, array of factors. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, we've got about 10, 12 minutes left, so I know there's got to be questions. And I guess Jesse? Could you come forward, I guess, so people can hear you? Maybe. Or maybe I should act like Phil Donahue. It's kind of a dated reference. Could you contrast the, the Bundy incident and the pa uh, pipeline incident now in the Dakotas? And so, for full disclosure, I live in Iowa and we also have a pipeline incident. <laughs> so, um, that pipeline that's being protested in the Dakotas is also being protested in Iowa. Um, Jesse, I haven't put all that much thought into pairing the two together, so let me do this a little bit off the cuff. The reasons that people protest action on land are always rational internally, but often not seen as rational externally. So the challenge that historians have is to do what is essentially uncomfortable and try to see from the perspective of Clive and Bundy. Why did he stop paying his grazing fees? It wasn't because he doesn't believe that the federal government is a legitimate authority. That's, that's how he rationalizes his decision, but that's not why he stopped paying his grazing fees. Why do um, Iowa, Iowa farmers and um, Native American peoples protest the pipeline being built in the Dakotas and across Iowa? There's a reason for that, and understanding those reasons is actually very difficult. Um, and each individual is gonna have a different reason. In Iowa, for example, because I'm a little bit more familiar with those protests, the farmers, typically talk about how the construction of the pipeline is turning over their topsoil. So Iowa has an extraordinary amount of depth in their topsoil, but this pipeline sits below that. So when it's, the construction is being um, conducted, uh, crews are turning up this soil and not putting it back in the layers in which they took it out. And this is an interesting problem to think about because if you turn, if you don't put the topsoil back, then how does that affect the farmer's ability to grow corn or soy the next year? And for however we feel about corn and soy crops in agribusiness, it's still you know about the health of the land itself. Jesse, does that answer your question? I, I, let me in here. Just as a side, having taught in Iowa as well, it's not just the soil. Profoundly valuable. Uh, it's also that while you drive through Iowa, you may see rural. It's actually one of the most industrial landscapes I've ever seen in life because of the, you know, the constant infusion of chemicals into it, but also quite literally, the soil has already been dug up. A subsurface of tiles has been laid all over the place. This is a heavily engineered landscape. So they're actually, whenever they're digging up the soil, they're digging up this infrastructure there that, you know, is very carefully laid out in order to manage water. And it's a very expensive proposition uh, to do that. And when somebody says, yeah, we're going to dig a trench right through the middle, it's going to drive everybody crazy anyway. Um, but back to your, your, your contrast in particular, Jesse. Yeah. Um, I would go back and forth. I think that an important distinction to make right at the beginning of race. Uh, when you're looking at Native American and First Nation protests, because the same sort of stuff is going on in Canada and BC, um, you're looking at people who are already marginalized by their very appearance and have a long, long, long history. And whatever plagues 
the Bundy family, because this generation goes long, long beyond, uh, it starts before five years. Um, there are some oppressions that Bundys have never, ever experienced. So that's an important distinction. And yet, what I would turn around and say that in practice, in, uh, in a practical sense, both have been long enduring a colonial relationship to the federal government. In the, in the case of not simply the bunnies, but all ranchers and rural resources, to, uh, resource users in the rural West, they are basically primarily engaged in a relationship with a series of government entities of whom none are representative, representationally selected. And that is colonialism, pretty simple. Um, and then moving back to the contrast again, I think a really important distinction is that, um, and this has been my experience in a number of contexts over my career, Indians in the United States have a better grasp of the Constitution than non-Indians do, because they have to live with its invocation, and it's only by res resorting to constitutional law that they've been able to protect themselves for a very long time, and I simply do not believe that the Bundys have any sort of sense of what the con is in the Constitution, let alone in legislative and judicial law. So those are very important distinctions between those two cases. Yeah, you might have just throw more sovereignty in there. Native nations like Standing Rock Sioux have a treaty relationship with the federal government. The federal government has a trust responsibility to those tribes, and that sets them apart from rural communities that may look like them and may have felt similar, similar um, Absolutely. effects. Yeah. There is one layer of continuity, though, that's worth pointing out, because um, I absolutely agree with what you said. But uh, calling into question the idea of how these eminent domain de declarations are made, which is sort of at the core of some of these protests, eminent domain declarations are made based on a perception of the public good. But what happens when you're not part of that public good? What happens when you're the one that pays the cost for that declaration? And I think that there's a lot more exploring than what we've done. And that's central to the size of the risk, the entire thing you're talking about. Here. I have a question. Um, mine is back to economics, if you don't mind. And it's a personal experience that my wife and I have had uh, with the taxation problem. This uh, great need the government seems to have for money and yet doesn't really contribute to, to the tax base. We live, my wife and I now, we've raised our family and live on a piece of property that's probably the most historically significant remaining piece of property in the community that we live in. And yet, uh, we live in this big old abandoned building uh, many years ago that has become our home and an art studio for many years. And we're taxed at five to seven times the rate of any of our surrounding neighbors. And the uh, problem with the, the way uh, property taxes are assessed is that they always refer to the highest and best use. But we think we're using the property for its highest and best use for, for ourselves personally. But the highest and best use for the community is condominiums or apartment houses, so we're paying taxes based on that. So I think this interpretation, I've done a bit of research on highest and best use, what that concept means, because that's the basis for taxation, not actual use of property. And I wonder how, as a historic, a historic organization, we can help lead the battle to preserve historic properties that are that the individuals are being taxed out of because of, of their potential speculative value. I do think though there's a, we have to make a distinction between the federal lands we're talking about here and the taxation you're talking about, which is done by local governments and counties, so a very different thing, but do you have to Well, I, you know, you can talk about this better than I can, actually, but the, you know, what he's referring to is a battle that goes on in, you know, many, many, many urban areas around the country about the politics and economics of um, preservation, you know, urban preservation. That's been going on for many decades now, but it's, you know, the way you do it is you fight like hell. I guess it's, you know, that's the only way I've seen this done anywhere over time. 
Because, yeah, there's always some... Look, at highest and best use is not actually a legally significant phrase. It's a political phrase. It is political rhetoric along with uh, verbiage like the people's land, the public lands, and stuff like that. And it gets invoked in such a way that if the second you actually see you know, rhetoric hit policy and become defined, you realize who are the actual people and who are the other people are just kind of marginalizing this. But that's, that's, that's American politics, period. We have time for one more quick question. I saw one over here, so I don't know where else. Okay. Great. I've studied all my relatives uh, writing stuff. And four corners were being set. All the little people came in there. Pretty soon, they see there was money, so the big people started coming in there with their clerks. They actually had wars between them. Pretty soon, they had so many big ranchers down there that you could tell where the herds were by the dust clouds. And then uh, the, di the cows were even dying out, and the, and the sheep were dying out. And then, I don't know just what happened, but they asked for the, to get a forest service in there to take care of it. Well, they were quite happy for a while. Then the forest service had to cut that back on the cattle. So now they're not at the pro service. It seems like every time, right now, all the people that I was related to and down in the two, the half a dozen towns down there, are dead, and their land is sold to some great big conglomerate, like the Bundys and a few of them that come in later. And, uh, and things are changed like they want to. Uh, do things like uh, our senators in our country, they're trying to take it away from the government that was actually taking care of it to the state so they can sell it to some rich man to take care of the, keep the people out. Um, what you're describing is a process that is central to the long history of regulation. Uh, What's often forgotten is that one of the key lobbying groups for bringing the federal government and especially the, the nascent forest service into regulating grazing was grazers themselves who wanted some sort of orderly process on the land so that they would stop shooting each other. And that is not an exaggeration. Um, the deadlines, the original meaning of the deadlines was exactly that. You crossed this, you got it and was the only way to regulate an unregulated landscape. So the federal government coming in, now they immediately got to stop, excuse me, but uh, they did over, you know, fees, raising fees and the structure of that. The battles that go on in the teens and 20s, again in the 40s and 50s, of raising, grazing fees gets hot and heated. Um, and yet, if you pull it back, you know, beyond the immediate uh, heat of the moment, everybody realizes some sort of regulation needs to be in place. And it's partly that, you know, the notion of selling these lands off is fantasy because they're not that valuable. And, you know, I talk about welfare loggers and welfare grazers. Well, underlying that is the, the reality that government subsidizes these activities, among other things. They can subsidize a lot of activities. That's what government does. It redistributes money. That's what happens with taxes. And the public lands, what they do is constantly redistribute and try and re respond to a series of pluralist demands on what these lands should, who these lands should serve and how. And that's been an ongoing, evolving contest. But it gets back to what I was saying before. That's American politics. It's a nasty form of politics. And it, it works very, very well when the various contestants either do not recognize or simply won't acknowledge the legitimacy of their opponents. 
And that's a lot of what's going on in the toxic rhetoric of politics across the nation today. But it's not new. It's kind of a heated moment right now. But you know, this battle over who gets access to land and why is the fundamental part of the system where you know, as much as we imagine it otherwise, the federal government and the federal agencies are constantly responding to, uh, I don't know what the right metaphor is, because it's not a tug of war, it's not binary. It's going on in many different way, directions simultaneously. Uh, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna cut you off, because it is, we've, we've, we've run out of time, and this has a final word, but we have other sessions coming up, so we really have to call, but I want you to join me in thanking these two scholars.